Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church.
Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Facebook and YouTube family. Praise God. I pray that all is well. I pray that God continue to bless all of you and keep you in such a time as this. This is hashtag Sabbath School Recap. And also this is um, hashtag Preaching Assignment. Praise God. I'm your host, Pastor Ernest Lee Fillmore Spellman, and I'm going to bring the word on to you on today. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. In other words, I pray the very God of peace to you on the Sabbath. I wish you many bountiful blessings on the Sabbath. Um, my son here asked the question, why do I do ministry on a Saturday? Um, here's my scriptural premise why I do ministries on Saturdays now, because, you know, people do evolve theologically. You know, I, I am still a firm believer of the tenets of the Christian faith, but when it comes to the word, I'm what you call an exegesis kind of a person. I'm an exegesis person. And exegesis is a theological word when, when one is teaching and preaching the word from a text, they a person will pull out from the text. This is what I'm going to do when I will pull out of the text. This is what Yahweh said. God, Yahweh, right? And Yahweh said this in the eighth verse of Exodus chapter number 20, verse eight. This is what Yahweh said. One thing about the nature of God, God is what? Immutable. In other words, he changes not. His nature doesn't change. You understand? So this doesn't change. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is what Yahweh said. You can read Leviticus chapter number 26, verse 2, as well as Deuteronomy chapter number 5, verse 12. It says, remember the Sabbath day. What is the Sabbath, Israel? Saturday. Yeah, Saturday, because... Check this out. You have, look, Sunday, Monday, look, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Seven days, right? Sabbath is seven. And the ninth verse says, six days you shall labor and do all your works. You find that in Luke chapter number 13, verse 14, the gospel according to Luke. But on the seventh day, say that, say that word out loud. Seven. Yes, seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you should do not do any work, you sh nor your son, like my son here, nor your daughter. If I had a daughter one, <laughs> you know, it's okay. You know, sometimes in life, you know, you'd be fortunate to have sons, you know, uh, and it says, nor your daughter. If I were to have a daughter, hypothetically speaking, she, she wouldn't work. Nor your daughter, nor your manservant. You know, I don't have a, a higher servant, you know, to take care of domestic things in the house. Nor your maiden servant, nor your cattle, nor your, your strangers that is within the gates. It says, in the love verse says, for in the six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallow it, meaning he he reverenced the Lord reverenced this day. It's hollow. It's supposed to be reverence. The Sabbath day is supposed to be adored. How many adored the Sabbath day? Hey, I'm not in your son. I'm for the preacher. This day is supposed to be hollow. In other words, this day is supposed to be adored. This day is supposed to be reverence. 
It's supposed to be respected, highly respect. Why you think the word of the Lord says what? Honor your father and your mother, right? 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 That word hollow means to honor, adore, reverence, all the synonyms, right? And it's and that's where I'm going to stop right here because the 12th verse says, honor your father and your mother that your days be long up upon the land which the Lord thy God hath given you. You see that? That's Exodus chapter number uh, 20 verse 12. That's regards to you. You know, and regards to me too. I'm maybe because I'm 51 years old. You think because I'm an adult, I'm going to disrespect my my late dad who's no longer here and my my mom who's still alive. I reverence my mom. You understand? So when it comes to the Sabbath, my son had a question. So I gave him the answer. Why I evolve? Why I do ministry on Saturdays now? Because the immutability of God. He didn't change. So why we are changing? And, and there's this whole controversy about the law and, and grace. You understand? You know, the curse of the law. Um, the law was a schoolmaster, was a schoolmaster pointing us to Christ, right? Yes, we are no longer under the law, we are under the dispensation of grace. But when it comes to the Sabbath, the Sabbath is not the curse of the law. Let me repeat this. The Sabbath is not the curse of the law. You understand? You know, so I just want to make that absolutely clear. I just want to get that out the way. All right. Enough chit chatter for that. Let's go on into the uh, Sabbath school lesson. Uh, right now we are in unit three. We just start. We, we're going to start unit three lesson means lives worthy of Christ. The overarching theme of, of the message is living in Christ, right? Living in Christ. That's the theme of, of the winter quarter, right? This book here, right? For those who are on Facebook and those who are my YouTube followers, this is going to be a pre-recorded message and I'm going to upload the video on that platform. Until I master to do both Facebook and YouTube at the same time, to God be the glory. I'm still working on that 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 technology right here. Right? But but to my YouTubers, y'all gonna get the pre-recorded message, it's gonna be uploaded and what have you. Yeah, in, in the YouTube in YouTube, you're gonna see a thumbnail that looks just like this. You're gonna see a thumbnail right here. It's gonna look just like this. My YouTube followers and what have you. So the 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 theme. The overarching thing is living in Christ. Each and every day, we got to learn how to live in Christ. You understand? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Another translation said a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We're talking about the newness of Christ. It's no longer us. It's the Christ that lives in us. I got somebody, I believe, from Pakistan named Babin Basa Romadi BTP. I got a lot of um people from Bangladesh are watching me and, and, and other parts of the Mediterranean who are watching me. I, I thank you so much for being my viewers. You know, and you you'd be surprised those who are who was once followers of Islam now they've been converted to Christianity. Um, thank you for my international audience, whether it be um in in Pakistan, whether it be in Bangladesh, or whether it be um in other parts of the world of um other Arab countries and, and those who, who watch me by the sound of my voice in Africa, you know, they, they be hitting me up, you know, thank you to my Af African audience for tuning in and so forth and so on. And I know y'all be hitting me up <laughs> Facebook messenger. It's, it's a lot of y'all, y'all be hitting me up. So I'm so inundated trying to hit everybody at once. That's why I'm using this, um, this platform to communicate with y'all all to bring uh, Christ in, in, 
in, in ever, whatever you go, whether you got this mobile device riding on a plane or listening in your car, um, in the comforts of your living room or whatever, whatever the place where you are remotely, you know, it is an honor and a privilege to bring the, the words of Jesus Christ into your, into your hands or into your television because a lot of TVs they have, um, um, especially smart TVs that have um, 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 media platforms that you get able to um, watch stuff on. on. Of course, there's the smart TV device. All right, without any further ado, we're going to go straight into the lesson. Right now, we're going to talk about the spiritual armor of God. That is Ephesians chapter number 10, verse 24. Uh, let, me, let me go to this Bible app here. Okay. All right. Let me make all right. I had unfreeze it. And um I'm going to expand it. Israel. Since you got OBS, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach you how to um do this technology. You see that? This is um the Bible show, right? This is what I'm gonna do. When you learn production, you go like this. You bring this down like this, boom. I'm, I'm teaching right now, boom. All right, and watch this. See the magic of, of production right before your eyes. See, voila. See, I'm teaching my son uh, how to use OBS uh, systems and stuff like that. All right, here it is. As you can see, the word of the Lord appearing to your screen. You see right here, Israel. Look. Dope, right? Fire, baby. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry, my sometimes my my bronchite comes out of me. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Let me turn to what page? Page one thirty. Let me turn to page one thirty. Okay. I'm gonna bring it back. Israel, I'm gonna show you this too. Look, look, look. You see how to do this? You squeeze it up like that, boom, and then you go back like that. Voila! All right. When you do your video platforms, you, I'm gonna teach you all that later on. <laughs> yeah. So um, yes, the lesson ten text of the scripture lesson text is. Spiritual armor right here, as you can see, spiritual armor. Uh, the letter text is coming from Ephesians chapter number six, verse verses 10 to 24. There are related scriptures like Romans chapter number eight, verse 26 to 27. Second Corinthians chapter number 10, verses one through five. First Peter chapter number five, verses six to 11. I'm not going to read it. Uh, that will be at your leisure. Uh, time when there was when this was written. Uh, it was 60 AD, meaning Amyo Danio, which means the, the year of our Lord. And the golden text is put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's Ephesians chapter number six, verse 11. All right. Let's read the scripture lesson text. And then at, immediately after that, I'm going to pray and then. We're going to go right into um, the teachings of the scripture lesson text. All right. Let me, um, here it is, Israel. Look, I'm going to go back to this. Watch this. Boom and boom. See? And then right here, I'm going to go right here. You're going to learn a lot about NDI technology too, All right? I'm sharing y'all my secrets, y'all. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make sure that. All right. Here it is. Let's start reading, shall we? You see right here? You bring it down every time you read. Right here. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Oh, snap.
think I hit it too quickly. Let's let's go back. Let's start over again. It says, follow me, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye, in other words, you all may be able to stand against the wiles. That word wiles means the tricks, the supplanting tricks of the devil, right? There it is. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore with your loins girt about with truth and having on the bless, the breastplate, I'm sorry, the breastplate of righteousness and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that my that utterance may rather be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Mysteries of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychius, I can't pronounce that word. I'm gonna try to do Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to all things whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that ye, meaning that you all might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So far the scripture. All right. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we come boldly to your throne of grace to give you thanks, praise, honor, and glory for your God. And besides you, there is no other. I decrease so that you increase, Lord. Speak a word, Lord God. Lord, let your word be sown on good ground so that we got 30, 60, and 100 fold of your word, Lord. Lord, anoint me afresh. It's the anointing that makes teaching as well as preaching easy. Lord, open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see you, Yahshua HaMashiach, in your word. And we so carefully give you the name praise and honor shall be done. And the Yahshua HaMashiach's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let me give you a little backstory on the book of Ephesians. I like to give backstories, you know, to, to give you an understanding the book of Ephesians. We all know that the book of Ephesians is one of the epistle writings of Paul. You understand? This particular book um, is an epistle. The epistle means writing of, of Paul. You have the Pauline epistles and you have the general epistles. Um, the Pauline epistles, you know, are epistles that were written, I guess, to a church. Um, but the general epistles, right, was written to the church, not a church. There's a difference. Let's say, for example, the Pauline epistle was written, let's say, um, the the book of Ephesians, um, the Pauline, the Paul, Paul, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the church of Ephesians. That's a Pauline epistle. But when it comes to the general epistles, like Paul, like. Who, who are the contributing writers? You have Paul, you have Peter, you have Jude, you have James, and so forth and so on. You know, these other epistle writers, and th these are general epistles were written to the church, not a church. You understand? So this particular epistle is a Pauline epistle. Uh, one, of, one of Paul's epistle, you know, he is, he was the apostle you know, you know, to the church of the Ephesians. Now, according to the book of Ephesians, right, is addressed to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Jesus Christ, yet living as beggars and only because they are ignorant of their wealth. And in other words, they were ignorant in regards to the spiritual wealth, not they, they weren't um living as beggars, you know, monetarily speaking, but it says um they were rich beyond measure in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, yet living as beggars, right? Only because they are ignorant of their spiritual wealth. Paul begins describing in chapters one through three the contents of the Christian heavily bank account. How many know that we as Christians, we have what you call a heavily bank account? The word commit means um, like, like Jesus Christ wrote to his, his protege, Timothy. He said, for I'm not ashamed and I know who I believe. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have Commit unto him. You understand? When we say commit unto him, we have what you call a spiritual bank account, a heavenly bank account. Oh, I feel a teaching and preach coming on right now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And it says, let me read this again. Paul begins by describing in chapter, chapter number one, verse three, the contents of the Christian's heavily bank account. Let's throw in ab adoption, right? Acceptance, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit. You know, whereby we are sealed unto the days of redemption, like, like Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, right? It says life, grace, you get the teachings of grace. And one day I'm going to do a teaching on grace, the, the misconception of grace. One day I'm going to do a teaching on that because there's so many misconceptions in regards to the dispensation of grace, the, the, the term grace. You know, should we use grace as license to sin? I'm going to talk about that, you know, in, in the near future. Right. And it says citizenship. Right. How many know that we are fellow citizens? Right. Now, notice that the wall of partition. Now, the wall has been broken down. No longer 
uh, the gospel is for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles, us Gentiles, Jew or Gentile. And I'm not going to get into the a uh, 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 a debate whether the blacks are the real Jews. I'm not going there today, but I'm letting you know that this is good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ that the walls of partition are broken, right? The wall of of the partition is broken. Now both Jews and Gentiles can be both engrafted in the family of God via through Jesus Christ. Are you glad about that? Hekhanadiyosata. Mm. I feel it right now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It says, in short, every spiritual blessing, right? Every spiritual blessing. In chapter number four through six, the Christian learns a spiritual walk rooted in his spiritual wealth. And in and, and chapter number six, it deals with um, learning how to walk in this spiritual walk rooted in his spiritual wealth. Whose spiritual wealth? Jesus Christ, right? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, right? Unto good works that we should walk in them. The traditional title of this epistle is Pros Ephesios, which means to the Ephesians. Many ancient manuscripts, however, omit an Epheso, meaning at Ephesus in chapter number one, verse one, right? Case in point, in, in chapter number one, verse one, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful and to Jesus Christ. Because this letter here is what you call an, an encyclical uh, letter, a cyclical letter. In other words, this encyclical theory proposes that it was a circular letter sent by Paul to the churches of Asia. It is argued that Ephesians is really a Christian treaty designed for general use. It involves no controversy and deals with no specific problems in any particular church. In other words, Often at times when Paul, when he was writing epistles to a certain church, like case in point, the church of the Corinthians, that church had major issues and Paul had to address certain issues, you know, regarding the church and even the church of Colossae and, and even um in the, in, in the, the church of um, Galatia, the Galatians. Remember Paul has said to the church of Galatia? The Galatians, he said, who bewitch you? In other words, who cast an evil spell that you obey not the truth? Some churches had problems, but this particular church, it doesn't sh share or shine the light on any particular heresy or apostasy here. But, but here it says this particular church involves no controversy, right? No problems, right? Right. And deals with those specific problems, you know, in any in particular. Right. Right. Church. Some scholars accept an ancient tradition tradition that Ephesians is Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. Colossians chapter number four, verse 16. But there is no way there is no way to be sure. However. If Ephesus began as a circular letter, right, and a cyclical letter, right, it eventually became associated with Ephesus. Why do you think Paul said, Paul, an apostle to Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus? And here's that conjunction, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ. It could be inferred that the faithful Jesus Christ is right, in the church of Ephesus or and the faith of, of Christ. And Ephesus, a sickly letter, is also was addressed to on the churches of Asia, right? Right? How many you slice it or dice it, it says it eventually became associated with Ephesus. The foremost of the Asian churches, another possible option is that this epistle was directly addressed to the Ephesians, but written in such a way as 
to make it helpful for all the churches of Asia. That's why it says, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ, whether those who are in the church of Asia and what have you, and so forth and so on, right? Now, let's read the introduction of the spiritual armor. Today's lesson is the spiritual armor, right? The golden text is, put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. According to the introduction, it says, it is easy to assume that once spiritual struggle is ended, once salvation is received. The new believer has finally found peace. Wow. It is true that salvation brings peace with God. In reality, let's address the elephant in the room. In reality, say with me, in reality. Come on. Let's let's keep it real 100. How we say, let's let's keep it a buck 50. Come on, the buck 100. Come on, let's be real fam. You know what I'm saying? In reality, about this Christian faith, you want me to address the elephant in the room, my, my beloved brothers and sisters? But in reality, the spiritual battles, key, key word, the spiritual battle has just begun. We are in a spiritual fight, my beloved brothers and sisters, because the enemy is at hand. He is lying wait to deceive us with false doctrine. That's, that is why it says, oh, follow me, my brother, put on the whole arm of God and all the powers might so that we get able to stand against the wiles and the trickeries of the devil. We are in a spiritual battle, my beloved brothers and sisters. I remember I preached a message in some, sometime in 2028, the summer of 2028. I said, this means war, right? And even I quoted Sun Tzu, the art of war. He said, the art of war is vital to the state. Let's, let's, I know this is not Bible, but let's, 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 let's talk about Sun Tzu because he wrote the book, Art of War. Because it has some similarities, right? Let's, let's quote a quote from Sun Tzu. The art of war is vital to the state. Sun Tzu's quote, the art of war is of vital, important, vital importance to the state. Let me read this again. Sun Tzu said, the art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a role either to safety or to ruin. It is vital to the state. You understand? When it comes to war, it is not just for the military commanders. It is a tool for the state to achieve important goals as defending the country and influencing others. So if we want to fight this war, we got to know the unlockings of the mysteries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why we are here. This is our learning lesson tools, my beloved brothers and sisters. How can we fight this spiritual war? This is why we have what you call teachings. And in, in, in the five assistant gifts, the, Paul the apostle said he gave to some apostles, to some prophets, to some evangelists, to some pastors and teachers. Right now, by the sound of my voice, you are hearing the, the, the principles, the tools, how we can fight this spiritual battle. Yes, we have peace with God. The Bible says the peace of God, which passes all understanding, should go out our heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Yes, we have the peace of God. However, let's address the elephant in the room. We will have what you call spiritual battles. Why do you think Paul said to his protege Timothy, I fought a good fight. I finished the course and I kept the faith. I, I fought a good fight. Meaning he, he fought to defend the gospel at all costs, even as far as him being crucified. Because when Paul wrote that to Timothy, Paul knew his hour has come. 
but he wasn't discouraged. It was like Martin Luther King, that last preach, when Martin Luther King said, I quote, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, we as Christians, we will go to, we are going to have spiritual battles. And right now we are learning the how to for all things, how to fight. Because the art of war, it is of, of vital importance to the state. Here it is. The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is, is a matter of life or death. It's a matter of life or death. If you don't put on your whole armor of God, you are left vulnerable to the schemes, the plots of the enemy. This is why we have to put on the whole arm of God, because this is a matter of life and death. If you want to go to the road that leads to um, safety, we got to put on our own armor where it says this. The, Follow me, my brother, to be strong in the law and the power of his might. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Let's let's continue reading. And it says the spiritual battle have just begun. Satan now wants to. How can I pronounce this word? And capitalist Sate, this soldier of the cross. Yes, because it's like Satan had a warrant out for Paul's arrest for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants to encapsulate this soldier of the cross, Paul, the apostle to the church of Ephesians. Because of this, Paul closed his letter by exhorting the Ephesians to stand firm in the struggle against the forces of evil. Yes, there are Satan forces of evil comes to be our opponent to, to, to discourage us in our spiritual fight in this Christian walk. You understand? So this is a spiritual warfare. If I had an audience, I would say, I dare you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, this means war. We are in a spiritual fight, my beloved brothers and sisters. We are living in a time where Satan wants to pervert the saints by, by false doctrine, false teaching. They are creeping unawares. And, and the devil has agents that are signed to creep in unaware tricks and plots and try to pervert. This gospel of Jesus Christ. We're living at a time where you have progressive churches nowadays who try to uh, infiltrate the church by teaching this 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 homosexual doctrine out there. And here's my disclaimer: I'm not here to bash the alphabet community, but I'm here to let you know that there are teachings out there that try to creep unaware for us, the believer, to accept. But we cannot accept it because we are no longer little children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness of men. We got to put on our own arm of God. Because Satan, his ultimate job is to kill, steal, and destroy. And how he would do it is by false doctrine, false teaching. We got to pull on our own arm of God, right? And it says, in this battle, Christians do not have to rely on their own resources. God gives his people the power to struggle. It's like the art of war. The art of war will give us tools. Like I could quote one of his quote. He says, know your enemy and know yourself. And 1,000 battles, you won't face peril. Sun Tzu also said, make your plans dark as night, but strike like a thunderbolt. What, what Sun Tzu is doing? He's giving tools how to fight a warfare. But, 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 we, but because we are of the Christian faith, but because we are of a Christian faith, we're going to learn how to put on this whole armor. Because we got to learn how to, to protect ourselves from head to toe. And we got to learn how to fight with this armor on. 
Because it's one thing to put on an armor, it's another how to use the armor. You understand? That's why when it comes to war, sometimes be before war, you, you got to, like the generals, they got to teach their man how to fight, how to use certain weaponries. Like case in point, the Chinese, uh, those who are martial artists, when they go to a Shaolin temple, they have to go through so many chambers. It's like their their boot camp and learn how to fight in in, in certain terrains, or, or they learn some strengthening tools technique. They, I'm gonna tell you right now, these Chinese they could grab two water buckets and they could they could stretch it with wingspans and and they can um walk. Let, let's say like a thin rope. It takes a lot of mastery to, to, to learn how to do stuff like that. And with war, um, when you are enlisted in a war, you, you got to learn how to go through boot camp to know how to use the, the, the combat boots, learn how to use that, that, that military, um, gun, you know, and so forth and so on. And how to go through barbed wires and crawling on your belly and stuff. That's that's practicing the art of war. Before they fight their opponent, they got to get in shape. In order for us to wear the arm of God, we got to get into spiritual shape and in stamina in, in, in order to know how to fight this war. You understand? We got to be prepared. Look at your neighbor and neighbor. We got to be prepared. Right? It says, in this battle, Christians do not have to rely on their own resources. God gives his people power for the struggle. Paul described the Christian's divine resource with a picture of an ancient infantry soldier. God has equipped, meaning prepared, equipped Christians with truth and righteousness. Here is the tools. Here is the armor tools. The tools are to be equipped with truth and righteousness to protect them from that's their spiritual armor, truth and righteousness, because there are there are opponents out there who want to att attack our truth in Jesus Christ. There are opponents out there who want to attack our righteousness in Jesus Christ. And these are those two tools that protect us, you know, from the the spiritual supplanting tricks of the enemy. His good news of salvation is their constant motivation. Through faith, they can deflect Satan's flaming darts of doubt. Salvation is like a helmet protecting their heads. And the word of God is an, an incisive word, sword rather, for counter attack. Finally, standing in the struggles required intercessory prayer. These are the, the tools, tools of righteous, the tools of truth, righteousness, and prayer. These are our spiritual armory to protect us from the tricks and the wiles of the devil. Let's let's dig deep in the word of the Lord. Here are the, the tools of truth. Of truth, righteousness, and accessory prayer. And it says above me, it says, follow me, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of, my, of his might. In other words, believers, that we have what you call a spiritual resource. We cannot do it in our own strength. Why you think the word of the Lord says it's not by might nor by power. It's by my spirit, said the Lord. We cannot fight this spiritual battle with our own strength. We need the strength of God. We need the, the tools of God. And it says, follow me, my brother, be strong in the Lord. Did it say be strong in ourselves? No, we have to rely on the strength of the Lord and the conjunction word and in the power of his might to be strong in the Lord and the strength, the power, meaning his strength. The strength of his might. The strength of his might. 
So in order to come back on uh, false truths and unrighteousness, unrighteousness and and those who want to come against prayer, we got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, like the scripture says. Because we cannot do it on our own selves. Because if we do not put on the whole armor, I'm telling you, we are left vulnerable for the adversary vices, his tricks, the supplanting tricks of the devil. Let's continue reading. It says, and this is <clears throat> the Pauline epistle, right? To the church of, of Ephesians. Like I said, this is an encyclical letter. It could be either directly to the church of Ephesus and the churches of Asia, right? Because Paul said in Ephesians chapter number one, verse one, it says, Paul, the apostle of Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and conjunction word to the faithful in Jesus Christ. It could be for the church of Asia too. So this Pauline epistle is giving instructions to the church of Ephesus, as well as the church of the churches of Asia, you know, the faithful in Christ, admonishing us, instructing us to put on the whole armor of God. It's for the believer, not the unbelievers, he's talking to the believers. <clears throat> Only the believers he's addressing to. He's not telling this to the unbelievers to say, put on the armor of, of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. No, he's talking about the believers. Now that the believers have been converted, now that they have been, they have received Jesus Christ, now that they have the peace of God, remember, we are in the spiritual warfare. Paul admonishing the church of Ephesus as, as well as Asia to put on, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole armor of God, that we may be able to stand against the wiles the key, the key word wows, the word wows means the tricks of the devil. You remember that commercial? Silly rabbits, tricks are for kids. You understand? <laughs> you understand? So, in other words, we cannot be tricked by that silly rabbit, which is Satan. <laughs> we cannot be boboozled. Who had tricked Eve in the garden? It was the serpent. The devil used the serpent as a conduit to get to Eve to trick her. What, what did the serpent say? You should not surely die. He said, God knows that the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be just like him. And so she saw it was good to eat and gave it to Adam. Adam didn't check her. Adam's supposed to be a standard man, but he didn't. They both saw that the fruit was good to eat. This is what I'm talking about. The tricks of the devil. That's why we got to put on our own arm of God because the devil is want, want, wants to attack our truth in Christ. The devil wants to attack our righteousness in Christ. And the devil wants to attack our, our prayer in, in Jesus. Because these are the spiritual tools that will keep us protected, not to leave us vulnerable to the... The, the cunning craftiness of Satan's uh, false teachings out there. All right. And it says, put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles, meaning the tricks of the devil. That's why we got to put on our own arm of God, because this is this means war. The enemy enemy wants to attack. All kinds of stuff that is in the gospel. The devil wants to attack marriage. Because the, the, the devil knows that marriage is a type of Christ is the, 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 the groom and, and she, the church, is the bride. The devil wants to attack uh, marriages. He wants to attack um, the lifestyle of people, men leaving the natural use of a woman and going to, to the man and the woman leaving, leaving the natural use of, of, a, of a man to go to a woman. You read that in the book of Romans. The devil, and the Bible says, before the son of perdition shall come, there must be a, 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 a great falling away. And it's true. 
in order for us to combat um, heresy and apostasy, we got to put on our own arm of God. And when we do that, we are protecting our spiritual truth, our spiritual righteousness and, and prayer. Put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The, and here it is. It says, really, our enemy is not our flesh and blood. Check this out. I'm going to tell you who is our real enemy. Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus as well as Asia. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He said, but here's the conjunction against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. I think principalities and powers means rulers and authority, but against rulers and authorities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Yes, the darkness, the evil of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. My God. But we got to wrestle against that principalities and powers, many rulers of darkness, rulers and authorities against the rulers of the darkness of this world. You got rulers and darknesses of this world. Uh-oh, the Illuminati. Uh-oh. The... Uh, I don't want to start to trouble... All even dogmas, teachings out there. You understand? Certain institutions that, that we got to come against. It said against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand withstand against the evil day. And having done all to stand, Paul admonishing the church of Ephesus as well as the church of Asia. Part in the background, nautical noise. It says, stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with what? Truth. Many having your belts tied about with truth. Now he's breaking it down. What the armor entails. The, the loins that we have, the belt that we have, we got to tie it about with truth. We got to stand fast on the truth of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we cannot allow the, the wilds of the the devil to infiltrate on uh, untruths that that's being crept unaware in, in the church. And it says having on the breastplate of righteousness, we got to protect our chest. Our righteousness is in, is in our heart. Out of the heart, believe unto righteousness. When you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from from the dead, out of the mouth is made unto salvation, and out of the heart believe unto righteousness. That's why Paul said, "Protect your chest, because the chest is the heart of righteousness." You got to protect the righteousness within our heart and our seat of emotion. So protect your chest, all right. And it says, "And having your feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace." Now he's he's naming all of these things down on what it means, what it entails when it comes to the whole arm of God. We can rest on the gospel people knowing that Jesus Christ was alive, dead, buried, and, and rose again. That is our gospel. We preach Christ crucified. We preach one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We have our feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. Yes, peace. You know? Peace. Yes, while we have peace, it is also a spiritual fight, a spiritual struggle that we are fighting. Let's continue reading. And it says, above all, taking the shield of faith that wherewith you quench, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You, are y'all reading a talk with me? Yes. All the fiery darts of the wicked. You understand? So Paul is breaking down all the armor of God and what it entails so so that we can counteract the the enemy's vice and schemes. We can counteract with our shield. We can counteract with the breastplate of righteousness. We can counteract with our loins girt about with truth. You understand? We can counteract that. 
Remember, Sun Tzu said the art of war is of a vital importance of the state. Right? Right? It is a matter of life or death, a road either to safety or to ruin. It is a vital importance for us. You understand? So we got to learn the spiritual tools, you know, for the state to achieve the important goals, such as defending our spiritual walk. Because we got to protect our spiritual walk. That's why we got to we got to pull our, our own arm of God. We got to be reminded that we got to put on our whole arm of God. We got to always always be prayed up. <clears throat> That's why we got to be consecrated. We got to be prayed up because the enemy, he comes with schemes and plots. His job is to kill, to steal, to destroy. His, his, his job is to en encapsulate us. He wants to destroy us. Like, he, like, like the devil wants to destroy Paul. The devil wants to destroy us. But Paul is admonishing us as believers that we got to pull on our whole arm of God. We got to protect ourselves. You understand? Let's address the elephant in the moon. We will have spiritual battles. That's why we got to learn that to how how to pull on these tools. We got to apply these tools. Yes, in order to fight the enemy. Right? Let's continue reading. <clears throat> and take the helmet of salvation, right? And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is how we counteract with the sword of the spirit. You, you have the, the armor like this, and you have the sword of the spirit to counteract. Psh, 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 psh. You understand? These are our armory to protect us. The word of the Lord, the sword of the spirit is the word of the Lord. Like, like Paul wrote, well, there's still an argument, whoever wrote the book of Ephesians, some say Paul, Barnabas, but whoever the writer was, right? He's, it says, the word of God is quick and powerful. In other words, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, because that sword has two edges, right? You can go like this, or that's our counteract. It's the word of the Lord, right? The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint of the marrow. The word is a, a, dis, a, a discerner of thoughts and the very intents of our hearts. So we need the sword and spirit, which is the word of God, to counteract. You know, when when the devil told uh, Jesus when he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, he said, I will have angels charged after thee. The devil knows scripture. He knows Psalms 91. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Have angels charged on me. Jesus Christ said, man should not man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. You understand? The devil knows the word of God too. But Jesus came came prepared because Jesus Christ is the Logos. He is the infinite logic, reasoning, wisdom, and reasoning and, and knowledge of God. How the devil going to out, out Logos the Logos? <laughs> this is why we are learning the Logos right now, the word of God, the words of Jesus Christ, so that we can protect ourselves, you know, uh, from the, the, the tricks and the plots of the adversary. Here it is. The devil wants to attack our prayer life. It says, pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. We got to always be praying. Man, uh, man always to pray and faint not. Pray without ceasing. Um, 1 Samuel chapter number 12, verse 23. Samuel said, God forbid that I sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you. But I show you a good and excellent way. We always supposed to be in prayer, constant prayer. And it says, pray always with all prayer. And what is prayer? It's a dialogue between God and man. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. It says, pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching, we got to be the watch man, right? And watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We, we're supposed to be always watched there unto 
with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We got to look out for each other. We got to intercede for one another. Paul is, is, is teaching us intercessory prayer, crash course 101 in Ephesians chapter number six, verse 18 says, pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watch there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We got to pray for one another. I, I'm still a firm believer in intercessory prayer. We got to pray for one another. If you see your brother slipping, instead of getting on a telephone and spilling tea, you're supposed to be praying for your brothers and sisters, not to talk about them, not to get on a telephone. Woe unto those who go on a telephone and not praying. You're doing the disservice to the body of Christ if you're going on a telephone, going to Lottie Dottie and everybody. If you are having a problem, right? If you see somebody slipping, you go to that prayer partner. Instead of spilling tea, you're supposed to pray. If I if I know if I'm in the need of prayer, I know I, I got certain ones on speed dial and who will not talk about my business, who I will get a prayer through. Will time out for for going on the phone and, and, and talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're causing that brother and sister in Christ to slip. You ain't watching, therefore, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You're not being an intercessory prayer. No, you are a gossiper. Let's let's call a spade a spade. Let me address the elephant in the room. You are a gossiper. If you do that, if you are, stop it. Kill that noise, fam. Kill that noise. We're supposed to be prayer intercessors. It says, watch it there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And even married couples, instead of going on the telephone talking about that spouse to another person, you're supposed to be, we, we both supposed to be praying. You're supposed to be praying for your spouse, not going on the telephone. Come on, I'm being, I'm keeping it real 100. I'm being led by the Lord to say all of this. You know, it's not I, it's the Lord speaking through me. Yeah, we got to be prayer intercessor. We got to pray for our marriages. We got to pray for our children. We got to pray for our children. We got to intercede for our children. They, they're not perfect. They still be molded and shaping. We got to be patient with our children. We can't vilify them. We got to pray. Come on. It says, that, watch therefore unto perseverance. We got to be watchmen of the Lord. We're all perseverance and supplication. We got to make our supplication known to God. We got to intercede for all the saints. We got to pray for our children. We got to pray for our spouses. We got to pray for the body of Christ. We got to start praying. If we do that, if we get on the telephone, we do a disservice and we're not putting on the whole arm of God. Because the devil, once again, he wants to attack the truth. He wants to attack our righteousness and he wants to attack our prayer walk and, and being intercessory prayers. This is good teaching. And it says, and for me, this is when Paul got personal. He says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. And it says, for which I am an ambassador, meaning he represents in bonds. When Paul wrote this epistle, this Pauline epistle to the church of Ephesus, you know, he was in, he was in prison at, at Rome. He had bonds. He's, he, he represent Christ in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul, even though he was in bonds and chains in Rome, and he writing this this encyclical letter, he was in bonds. He did not let the, the 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 condition or the circumstances to discourage him to put to be inspired by God to put put an inspiration to pen to pen this 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 word saying that I am an amb ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Hey, another view something, and he said that you. All also may know my affairs and how to do. Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to all things. It says, whom I have sent unto you for all the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Notice how he spoke highly about Tychius. His fellow labor in the Lord, how he's going to, he, he said, I have sent un, unto you 
for the same purpose that you might know our affairs, that he might comfort your heart. Paul had help. And it's wonderful to know that when we have intercessors and we have people in the body of Christ will fight with you and fight for you and who believe in the same cause for you. Because Tychius, he's a fellow brother in the Lord. He's sending his fellow brethren to encourage y'all. Yes, I'm, I'm being inspiration by, you know, Holy Spirit to pen to write to you. But guess what? I'm sending y'all help. It's good to know that God will send us help. Someone with like spirit, like mind, and like faith. You understand? Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that you all might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. We're supposed to be in the business of comfort out each other's heart, not to destroy each other. It says, peace be to the brethren and love with, with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's closing out with that doxology. It says, grace be with you all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Praise God. Amen. This was good teaching. Let me give you uh, practical points and then I'm going to get into the preaching of the word. It says practical point number one, apart from God's help, we are no match for Satan. Like I have forestated, if we don't receive the power and strength of God, we ain't no match for the devil. It says our greatest adversary is not the person who opposes the gospel, but the spiritual power that inspires that opposition. Practical point number three says we can resist Satan's temptation only if we are solely grounded in the truth and are living out that truth in our lives. Practical point number four says a living faith occupy, I'm sorry, a living faith coupled with a knowledge of God's word is our best defense against the errors Satan promotes. Practical point number five. Continue prayer is necessary for the gospel is to go forth boldly and effectively. Practical point number six, the encouragement of fellow believers is a ministry in which we all should participate. And practical point number seven, real peace is a blessing that comes only from God. Amen. So far the scripture, next week lesson will be um, supremacy of Christ. That is Colossians chapter number one, verses fifteen to twenty-eight. All right, that that is next week's uh, uh Sabbath school lesson. All right, all right. Now I'm going to get to the preach word of the Lord. Is there a word in the house? Is there a word from the Lord? I believe there is a word from the Lord. I still got my old school Bible, but guess what? We got the Bible on top of here too. I'm going to Expand it so that you can all read with me. <clears throat> all right. Hold on a second. Here it is. Let us read. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us not go on unto perfection. Let's read this again. Therefore, leaving the principles of Christ. Therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ. 
let us go on into, unto rather, perfection. Not laying on again the foundation of repentance from the dead works. Uh, and I'm sorry. Dead works and of faithful toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have taste, tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And if shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, my Lord, alas, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, and bring forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receive, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things for you and things that accompany salvation through we thus speak. The 10th verse I want to emphasize strongly. This is where I'm going to use for a subject in Hebrews chapter number six, verse 10. It says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and the labor of love, which you have showed toward his name and that you have ministered unto the saints and do minister. That's where I'm going to take my my subject for a moment. Verse 11 says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers, followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Right. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Saying, surely blessings, I will bless thee and multiply, I will multiply thee. And so after. He had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For man verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. I spoke that word before about the immutability, meaning that God changes not, of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things to which it, it was possible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuse to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul be sure, both sure rather, and steadfast, and which enter into 
that which is within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered when Jesus made a high priest after forever after the order of Melchizedek. So far, the scripture. But let's go to the 10th verse. And it says, for God is not unrighteous for, for to forget your works and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name. And that which you have ministered unto the saints and do minister. If I were to use for a subject for a moment, my beloved brothers and sisters, it would be God remembers your acts of service. Once again, God remembers your acts of service. Father God, in the name of your son Jesus, once again, open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. When we want to see you, Jesus, in your word. It's the anoint, Lord, anoint me afresh. Once again, it's the anointing that makes teaching and preaching easy so that you may be glorified. Once again, let your word be sown on good ground so that we got 30, 60, 70, 100 fold of your word. And we so carefully give your name and praise. Honor shall be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's give a backstory of the book of Hebrews. There has been this constant argument of whoever wrote the book of Hebrews. Some say Paul, some say Barnabas. Most theologians will side on the pendulum of Paul, because this particular Bible, it says the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. But once again, let's make clear, we don't know who is the author of this particular book, but we know that the chief off author is Jesus Christ, right? So that being said, most theologians will side on the pendulum saying that this is an epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. Now, notice, yes, we could theologically agree that Peter's message of the gospel was for the Jews. And we could agree that the Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. Notice most of Paul's Pauline epistles, he wrote to the churches, right? Right? So now, in this particular epistle, now he's writing to the Hebrew believers, because according to this particular epistle, many Jewish believers, having stepped out of Judaism into Christianity, want to reverse their course in order to escape persecution by their countrymen. Paul or Barnabas, whether Paul or Barnabas, was writing to the church, writing to the Hebrew converts. The purpose by writing to the Hebrew converts because the Hebrew converts, they have left Judaism and came into the faith of Jesus Christ. And they were afraid and it, it, it could have caused them to reverse their course because they want to escape persecution by their countrymen, their own people. Remember, Paul, one time, before he had that road to Damascus experience, Paul 
was a Pharisee. Paul had letters from the Sanhedrin court to persecute the church. Paul was responsible to have Stephen, the first moderate, to die. Paul was under the great masterful teacher. His name was called Gamula. Paul had two, two dual citizenship. He was Saul of Tarshish, and he had dual citizenship. He was a citizen of Jerusalem. Paul often traveled from 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 Tarshish, where today where it's located is Spain. He traveled from from um, I'm sorry, Turkey rather, from Turkey to Jerusalem, from Turkey to Jerusalem, right? To be under this tutelage to learn the Torah. And, and, and it's interesting to note that how the Jews today, how when they interpret the text, they interpret the elders of the text. They don't do like some of us do when we are preachers and teachers of the word. We exegete, we pull out from the text. But Judaism, when they hear the, the ancient manuscripts, they hear what the elders had taught them. You understand? But we as Christians, when we read the word of God, we read with an exegetical mindset to pull out from the scriptures. Yes, Paul, with that Judaistic pedigree, yes, Paul gave a autobiography of his life from the tribe of Benjamin. He had he was devout to the Jews' religion. Now, if if it's true that Paul is the writer of of this epistle to the Hebrews. He was encouraging, admonishing the, 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 the Jewish believers to, to be steadfast in their faith. And don't worry about their countrymen regarding the persecution and so forth and so on. It says, many believers having stepped out, and many Jewish believers having stepped out of Judaism into Christianity, want to reverse their course in order to escape persecution by their countrymen. Notice how it says the writer of Hebrews, <clears throat> whether it be Paul or Barnabas, whoever, exhort them, Jewish convert believers, to go on into perfection. Right? Which, in fact, I read that in Galatians chapter number one, verse one, right? to go on into perfection, meaning completeness to maturity. His appeal is based on the superiority of Christ over the Judaistic system. Christ is better than angels, for they worship him. He is better than Moses. Yes, because the pretext of that religion was the law of Moses given unto the Jews back then. The first constitution was the Ten Commandments. It is in Exodus chapter number 20. And what have you. So yes, Jesus is better than Moses. You understand? For he created him. Who created Moses? Jesus created Moses. We talk about the fullness of the Godhead now. He created Moses. And we all know the name Moses means to draw out, right? Jesus, he, in other words, Jesus, better than the Aaron, Aaronet priesthood. He was better than the Levitical priesthood because Moses was from the tribe of Levite, Levi. Levi. And there came the inception of the Levite priesthood, starting with his brother Aaron and his sons. Remember that that story in the Bible when when Aaron's sons had made strange fire unto the Lord, and the Lord had consumed his sons. That's going to show you that you cannot play with the sacredness of of worship of God. 
Yes, he is better than the than the Aaronic priesthood. For his sacrifice was once for all time. Jesus Christ died one time. You understand? He, Jesus Christ is better than the law. Right? For he meditates a better covenant. Right now, we have a new covenant. This new testament is called grace. We're under grace. We are no longer the law. Some of the law were of a, of a curse. But not all things in the law was a curse. I still hold to the belief that God, in, in Exodus chapter number 20, he said, we got to hallow the Sabbath. That wasn't a curse. Some preachers, some theologians will preach that all the stuff that are in the law was an a curse. I beg a differ. This not an accursed thing when, when, when Jesus himself said it in Exodus chapter number 20. Let's go to Exodus chapter number 20. Right? This is not a, an accursed. If I read the Ten Commandments, you, you'll say this all of this is not an accursed. They were it, it, it's interesting to note that there were 613 laws of the you know of the commandments. We're talking about not only in the book of Exodus, we're talking about the book of Leviticus. And also there were laws that were added in, in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was a book that was written for the second generation of, 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 of the children of their forefathers who, who were with Moses through the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They don't know. They, they have not experienced that. But the second generation, they was comfortable being at a, a specific geographical place. But it was. But it's for us as Christians, we cannot be comfortable being in one geographical place. Now, in, 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 in Exodus chapter number 20. It still hold true today. It says, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Reminding the, 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 the Hebrews that it was the Lord God had brought them out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. You should have no other gods before me. It still holds true to, this, to till this day. This is not an accursed thing. Right? Thou should not have no other gods before me. Thou should not make unto any graven image, meaning carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under, under the earth. You should not bow down yourself or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, who visited the iniquity of the fathers and the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and so forth and so on. I can read on and on. Let's drop down to the verse eight. Uh, it says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and, and do all work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of, of the Lord your God and it you should not do any work you should not, nor your sons, nor your daughter, nor your man service, nor your maid service, nor your cattle, or nor your strangers for that within your gates. For in, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all in them is, and rested on the summer day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Since when we changed that? No, we, the Lord didn't change that. So therefore, that's not an accursed thing. You feel me? It is not an accursed thing. So yes, Jesus, Jesus is better than the law. He meditates a better covenant right now. The, the covenant that, that we have now is the dispensation of grace. Right? We are on the grace, cardinalist, which means unmerited favor. Right? In short, there is more to gain in Christ than to be lost in Judaism. If this is the writing of Paul, 
And if this deemed to be true, he's what Paul proposes that that to the audience, the, the Hebrews, Jesus is better than all the things that are pertaining to the Judaistic system. Right? He is better than than um the angels who worship him. He is better than Moses. He who, who we had created. He is better than the Aaronic covenant, the law of the, 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 the Levitical priesthood. He is he because Christ has sacrificed once and all. We don't need to bring an animal sacrifice anymore. Jesus Christ was that spotless lamb. He was slain. And Jesus Christ was that scapegoat. You understand? That taketh away the sins of the world. He's better than that, that day of atonement that the Jews do annually back then. He is better than the law. He's better than 613 laws. He meditates a better covenant. In short, there is more to gain in Christ than be lost in Judaism. Pressing on in Christ produces test faith self-discipline, and visible love seen in good works. Although the King James Version uses the title, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews, there is no earthly manuscript evidence to support it. The oldest and most reliable title, that simply means pros arabionos which means to the Hebrews. So we don't know who wrote the book, but we know that it was an author had been inspired by God to pen this word to admonish the Hebrews to be steadfast in faith in Christ through persecution. And you think this message is just only to the Hebrews? No, this message is for us because like I had taught about the whole arm of God, that we as Christians, we got to put on the whole arm of God because the enemy wants to attack our truth, our righteousness, and our prayer walk with Christ. Now, because the Hebrews are facing persecution by their own countrymen, Paul was admonishing them that Christ is better. So don't be discouraged. Is Christ. He speaks better than, let's go to the 20th verse, where it talks about, it says, where, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus Christ made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Even after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ is made a high priest forever. The Bible says Jesus in the book of Hebrews, the Bible said Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand throne, making, making intercession for us. He was better than the first high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So what Paul was admonishing the, the believers not to walk away from their faith, because if they walk away from their faith in Jesus Christ, right, and go back to Judaism, Paul was admonishing them that you don't have to, once again, you know, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. He says, let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and faith toward God. Because the, the Jews, the Hebrew converts, because they were facing persecution by their countrymen, Paul was admonishing them that, if you do that, why do you want to, you know, lay again the foundation of repentance from dead? Why do that all over again? Why do your first work back all over again? You know what I'm saying? Why laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God again? Why do that when you when you are facing persecution? That's that goes for us too. Let's say if we backslid, go back in the world. Why we have to go again to lay again the foundation of repentance and, and from the dead works and of faith toward God. Thank you, my love. Why again we have to 
receive the doctrines of baptism again. Why do we have to go down to the water again? You understand? He addressed it to the Jews, not only to the Jews, to us too, a little 2,000 years ago, later. Why, why, why be taught again the, the doctrines of baptism again? Right? Remember, the devil's job is to bring false doctrine. We got to put on the whole arm of God so that we can um, stand against the wiles of the devil. Why, Church of Hebrews? Why even us? Why we have to be taught again the doctrines of baptism and the laying of on of hands, right? And of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Why be taught that again? Because if you do come back, Hebrews, whether we, us two Gentiles, whether we come back, why try to do that all over again? Because Christ did it once for all. Why do that again? And it says also, and do this will do if God permit, if God permit, we don't have to do that again. Okay. Yes. And it says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. It is Paul, Paul or Barnabas, whoever the writer to the, to the Hebrew church that is being persecuted by the countrymen because of their faith in Christ. Right. Paul is saying, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. It is impossible. You know? My son looking at me like... <laughs> Going to do something too. It's like, for it is impossible. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened. That's why I'm encouraging y'all, those who are hearing by the sounds of my voice, who are going through spiritual struggles and, and, and the devil is, is, is wearing and tearing your, your Christian faith. I'm, I'm here to let you know, you know, you are enlightened. So, that being said, my fellow Jews and my fellow Gentiles. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gifts and made partakers of the Holy Ghost. I can tell you right now, on the July 9th, 1993, the, my late spiritual mom, Colleen Woods, when I got on my knees, when I was crying out to Jesus and I tasted that heavenly gift, I saw a bright light and I felt that I felt the the, 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 the the power of God charged to me and I and I saw it's like I saw the glimpse of Christ and I saw that bright light and it touched me. Yo, I cried like a baby and I spoke in tongues. So it is impossible for those who were, was once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gifts. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. It is impossible for you to to erase all of that out from your your enlightened mind, and you have tasted tasted that heavenly gift. I tasted that heavenly gift, and I can't act like it was out of sight, out of mind. You understand? And I can't have this out of sight, out of mind of me. Being a partaker of the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's continue reading. And it says, and have tasted the good word of God. And have tasted the good word of God. Who is that that prophet in, 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 in the Old Testament scripture? When he ate the scroll and, and the scroll tastes like honey. Let's, let's search this. Who is that, that prophet? Who tasted the scroll and it tastes like honey? I'm going to bring it up. So have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I'm going to give it to y'all. 
the prophet who ate the scroll and tastes like honey. Oh, it was, I think it's in Ezekiel. It says, so I opened up my mouth and he gave some the scroll to eat. Then he said unto me, son of man, eat the scroll for I am giving you to fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, right? And have tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He, then he said unto me, son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. That is in, in Ezekiel chapter number three, right? So it's like, and you have taste the good word of God and the powers of the world become. Why do this again? Hebrew, Hebrew Christians, Hebrew converts. Come on. I'm like, but I'm on a roll. If they shall fall away. And to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they have crucified themselves, the son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. No, we don't want to do that work again. Don't, don't go back to Judaism. You don't want to do, do the foundation of repentance all over again. And you have tasted the word. You have receive and you have been enlightened by, by by the power of the Holy Spirit been enlightened by Christ it says if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing that they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame don't do that what well, Paul admonished the church or Bottomus if you will don't do that. Don't, don't fall away. Don't go into apostasy to leave truth and go back to error again. Come back to truth. What the, the Holy Ghost is admonishing me to tell y'all, y'all got to come back to truth again. If you had stepped out of the will, if you went backslid and went back to, to those old ways, and some Jews had went backslid and go back to Judaism, Come back to Christ. If you, if they shall fall away to renew th them again unto repentance, saying they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. Christ did it once. Christ didn't die again and again and again. Christ did it one time for us. The Bible said without shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sin. Christ did it once for, for us. Christ is not coming back again as son of man to die on the cross for, for our sins again. Christ did it once and for, for all. He did it all. So, so whoever the writer of the book of Hebrews, whether Paul or Barnabas, was encouraging them that, that if y'all do this again, y'all put him into an open shame. Like, like you crucified the son of God afresh again. No, Christ did it once and for all. He did it once and for all. It says, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that come off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it was dressed and receiving the blessings of God. Talking about the earth now, which drink in the rain that comes off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed and receive the blessing. Paul or, or Paul or Barnabas, whoever the writer of Hebrews was using an analogy about how the earth was receiving the rain that cometh often upon it and bring forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed and receive the blessing of God. That's how God blessed the earth. Now, eighth verse says, but that which bear thorns and briars is rejected. They are the negative ones. They are rejected and, and is nigh, meaning near unto cursing, whose end is to be burnt. Talking about these thorns and briars is rejected. There's no good things in, 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 
in regards of thorns and briars. They reject it. They are our opponents. And it says, and is nigh unto cursing, and whose end is to be burned. But beloved, talking about the Hebrew converts who are facing uh, persecution by the countrymen. He said, but beloved, <coughs> excuse me, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation through we speak. Christ speak better things than the angels, better things than um, um, Moses, better things than um, the Aaronotic priesthood. He speak better things better than the law. You understand? There's much to gain through Christ than Judaism. He is better. Therefore, we as believers, as well as Hebrews and us Gentile believers, we are persuaded, meaning we are convinced better things of you and things that accompany salvation through we thus speak. For God, here's my message. If I dare you look at your neighbor as a neighbor. God remembers your acts of service. It says, for God is not unrighteous to forget the work and the labor of love which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and, and do minister. God has not forgotten. The Jews almost forgot why they were being persecuted by their own countrymen. They almost forgot about Christ, the goodness of Christ. And what Christ can bring to the Jews. Even Paul said, for God is not unrighteous to forget the work and the labor of love which you had showed toward his name. And that you have ministered unto the saints and also ministered. God has not forgotten your works, Jews, whoever the writer of Hebrews. And it's us a little over 2,000 years later too. Because we are trouble on every side. We are pressed. We are trouble on every side. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted. Keyword persecuted but not persuaded. But cast out but not destroyed. You understand? Always a bearing about the body and the dying of Jesus Christ. As we carry our cross each and every day. Right? And following after Christ. We cannot be mindful to forget what Christ had done. If Christ is not, un, if God is not unrighteous to forget the work and the labor of love, which uh, you have showed forth in his name and, and that which you have ministered unto the saints and do minister, so shall we cannot forget. Let us not forget what he has done for for us leading us to Calvary. Remember that song? Before you take communion, I forgot that song, that old school song. You know, I not forget. Let me see that song. When the Holy Spirit bring back certain things in my remembrance. Let's not forget what he done for me leading to Calvary. Here, here's the lyrics for the song right here. You know that refrain. Let me sing the refrain. It says, Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. It cannot be the I'm getting emotional now. 
lead me to Calvary. Mm. Oh my God. That refrain got me. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thy agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Yes, we're going to go through trials and tribulation. We're going to go through this spiritual persecution. But we cannot forget what Jesus Christ did at Gethsemane. He had that moment. He said, Father, if it's possible, let the cup pass me by, but nevertheless, thy will. Jesus was at the place called Gethsemane. It was the place called the crushing. That's where people go to make wine out of grapes, out of crushing. Jesus Christ felt the agony at Gethsemane. Lest we forget what he had done for us. What Paul was admonishing to the, the Hebrews. Don't forget Gethsemane. Don't forget Christ's agony. What he did. You know? Don't forget the love what he has shown to us when he died on the cross. Let us not forget Calvary. Let us not forget Calvary. Let us not forget Calvary. We cannot forget God. He's not the God that, that we serve. He's the God of amnesia. He says, for God is not unrighteous. In other words, God is fair not to forget your work and the labor of love which you have showed toward his name and that you have ministered unto the saints and also minister. If I had an audience, I said, look at your neighbor and said, neighbor, God remembers your acts of service. God never forget the works that you have done and show forth in his name. So yes, it seems like what we're doing for Christ, it is um, it is futile, vain, empty, but no, what Christ is doing for us, it's not futile and vain and vain. God is un God is not unrighteous, meaning God is fair to forget. Not to forget your works and labor of love. God remembers your works. Why do you think Paul the Apostle had told the church of, of Corinth, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always, about, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You understand? So God remembers your works. So when we are facing persecution, my beloved brothers and sisters, by our family members, those who are closest to us, we got to stand fast there. We got to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work. For as, as much as we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So God is an example of one who is fair, who will not forget your works. So don't you forget. God remembers your acts of service. Stand fast because this, this Christ that, that we are living, one day he will come back. Romans chapter number eight, verse eight says, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed unto us. One day when Christ comes back, all of what 
we have gone through, right? We have a place in the kingdom of God. You understand? So we got to comfort one another with these words, knowing that Christ has done it once for us. We don't have to be, we don't have to give up. That's what the Bible says um, in Galatians um, 6 and 9. It says, be not weary and well doing. For in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. So Christian Hebrews, Christian Gentiles, be not weary of well-doing. God has not forgotten. We don't want to forget. I'm just saying that, that, that refrain of, of that song. Because that put me to tears. Because every time, next week, I'm going to do communion. And it says, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget your agony, lest I forget your love for me. Mm. I'm getting emotional now. Lead me to Calvary. Lead me to Calvary. Lest we forget. God has not forgotten our works. So we're going, Christians, what we're going to do, we're going to continue to be steadfast, unmovable. I don't care what it looks like. Husband and wives, we cannot forget what God has brought both together. Fathers to their, their sons and daughters, Fathers and, and, and mothers, let's not forget our children. Sons and daughters, let us not forget your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother for your days will be long on this face of this earth. We cannot forget these things. Let us not forget what Christ has done. He died from the cross for our sins. We cannot. Hey, God, not that he was such. God is fair to not to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name yes i know we are you know we are living in perilous times but we cannot forget what christ has done and we can he's he's not he didn't forget your good works so husband and wife sons and daughters Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's 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 continue to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where with Christ, who has made us free, and and let us not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage, like Paul wrote to the church of um, the Galatians. We, all right, let's keep telling the whole fast, because he didn't forget, and because he didn't forget, guess what? Greater blessing is coming our way. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, greater blessings coming our way. Yes. Let's continue reading. It says, and we desire that every one of you do, do show the same diligence, right, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. And, and we desire, we as Christians, we got to desire that every one of us do show the same diligence. That same perseverance to, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. One day when Christ comes back for, for the dead in Christ and, and the alive will remain, we're going to be caught up and meet him in the air for those who are left behind. That great tribulation, my, my, my. Yes, those Hebrews and, and based based on the book of uh, Ezekiel, yes, yes, they will come back, but they're gonna have to acknowledge. In order for them to be engrafted in in the family of God, they got to acknowledge Jesus Christ. Otherwise, if they don't acknowledge Jesus Christ, they're gonna miss the mark. Yes, prophetically, that's gonna happen. But they got to 
They got to bow. Every The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Jews, the Gentiles, we all got to bow down. Remember, the wall of petition has been broken, has been torn down based in the book of Romans. That both Jews and Gentiles come together, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. We all go to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord for those who are the redeemed. Whoever the writer of Hebrews, the, the Hebrew church wasn't left out. They all got to acknowledge Christ. He speaks better things than, than the angels. He speaks better things than Moses. He speaks better things, things than the Arianotic covenant. He speaks better than um, the law, right? Because there's much more to gain through Christ than the past old covenant. Yes, the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And they that are alive remain shall be caught up together in the cloud together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we forever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Yes. But yes, prophetically, Ezekiel, that's going to come to pass. But guess what? They got the Jews got to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whoever wrote this to the Jewish converts and their countrymen, who their countrymen, they own people. Remember, Jesus Christ said this in 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 um John, the Gospel of John, chapter number one. Let's read Gospel of John, chapter number one, verse one. Where it says here, and you can read this in Isaiah chapter number 53, verse 3. It says, and he came to his own, and his own received him not. Talking about the Jews now. And let's, let's go to Isaiah. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believes on his name. Whoever the writer of Hebrews is letting the, the Hebrews know that, that if you have received Jesus, God has given them power, in other words, right to become the sons of God. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter number 5, 53, verse 3, that familiar passage of scripture. 53, verse 3. I'm freestyling the Holy Ghost. I'm being obedient with the Lord. The Bible says, and he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if were our faces unto him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And John says this. And he came to his own. Who? His own. His Jesus Christ came to his own countrymen, the 12 tribes of Israel. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to give power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, in the book of Hebrews, there are the, the, the Jews converts that believe on his name. Because of the per persecution of their countrymen, they were they were contemplating on reverting to come back to Judaism, which was a curse. Not here's my disclaimer: not everything in the in, in, in the law was a curse. We still got to hold fast to worship only one Lord thy God. We still got to hold fast to the Sabbath. That's not a curse thing. No. Because God said it himself in, in Exodus, the seventh day is supposed to be hallowed. You can find all the new scriptures in the world, whether in Colossians, talking about, do not let any man judge you by the new moon on the Sabbath. We could, we could go there. But 
the Sabbath didn't change. You understand? Here it is. In, in, in Colossians chapter number 2, verse 16, it says, Let no man judge you in meat or drink, meaning food or drink, or in respect of a, a an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Sabbath days. Some theologians would say that, okay, now that we're no longer under the law, we can worship on this on, on, on the Sunday. It didn't say that. It says, let no man judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. That's not an accursed day. But some theologians will. I'll try to get this your attention to her. Yeah. So. So those those are the the teachers of the Lord. We still hold hold to that, and some will probably say, "I'm a Judaizer," you know, you know, because the Judaizer said, you know, you got to be circumcised first. No, I'm not a Judaizer. <laughs> I'm a I'm a Christian who just so happy to to hold the truth of the keeping of the Sabbath day, the Sabbath days. I'm a, I'm a non-denominal Christian, respect highly of the Sabbath days. You understand? It says that ye be not slothful, but followers of them through faith and patience inherit, inherit the promise. We got the promise that, that, that is inherited to us, Jesus Christ. We got something that, that is that that we are waiting for. We have a, a an inheritance. You understand of the promise. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no other, no greater, he swore by himself, Sh saying, "Surely blessings I will bless thee and multiply you." And multiply, I will multiply thee. That was that covenant that that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter number twelve, right? Paul, whoever the writer of Hebrews was reminded them about the promises of God. You understand? Them being the chosen ones and what have you. Don't forget that everything tied in the connection of Abraham all the way to Jesus Christ. Right. And so after he patiently endured and obtained the promise. Right. For men verily swear by the greater and all for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. It says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Even God swore by his own oath, his immutability. He promised both Jews and Gentiles this abundant blessing for us to be heirs of the promise of the immutability, meaning the unchangeability of his counsel. Confirmed it by an oath. You notice I know I use this term a lot. It's a theological term, immut immutable, meaning God didn't change. His his heavenly promises to the Jews and to rather well, to the Gentiles hasn't changed. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, by two unchangeable things in which it is was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, meaning a strong comfort to have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. 
And Paul had to include himself into it because he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul is an, an apostle or whoever the writer of Hebrews, whether Barnabas had wrote this or whether Paul has wrote this. Both of them are from the tribe of Israel that we got something better. We are heirs. And, 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 and remember, the walls of the partition has broken. Now, now um, Gentiles can, can partake of that. The Gentiles are the the wild branches that is connected to. Long as they have faith in Jesus Christ, because if, if Abraham was imputed unto righteousness before there was a law, we too are imputed unto righteousness because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is before the law. You understand? We have faith in Christ. Abraham had faith in God. He's imputed unto righteousness because he had faith trusting in God, the voice of God. Genesis chapter number 12, leave his kindred and all that stuff. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. You know, we are the promised seed of Abraham. Hey, glory be to your name. That we have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay upon the hope that is set before. We have fled as refuge from, from that, the curse of that Judaistic law. And lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Jesus speak better things than the law. He speak better things of the angels. He speak better things of, of Moses, uh, the Aaronic covenant, and, and, and the law. There's a great hope that is waiting for us, both Jews and Gentiles. But, but this is talking to the Hebrews now because they were facing persecution by their own countrymen. It was like saying, ooh, they break in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear me, O Israel, that the Lord God is one. Since when Yah, since when um Jesus is 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 in the place of Yahweh. No, the Father and, and, and Christ are one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh, and we brought among us. We beheld his glory. The, the, the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead based on Colossians. And Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ. All of the fullness of the Godhead that is in Jesus Christ. You understand? All of, right here. And it says, check this out, in the 19th verse in Colossians chapter number 1, verse 19. And it says, it says, let's, let's read um, a couple of verses before. And it says, look, this is, he wrote to the church of Colossians, right? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even forgiveness of sin, who is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, meaning first in rank of every creature, for by him were all things created, that are in the heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they, they be thrones or dominions, principalities, nor powers, all things were created by him and for him. For he is before all things, and by him all things consist, meaning all together. For he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, meaning the first begotten from, from the dead, or first in rank from the dead, that in all things he might have have preeminence, meaning rule. The 19th verse, and I'm gonna stop right here. It says, it pleases, it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, meaning all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwell in the Son. So Jesus Christ speaks better things than all the things, better than the Judaistic system, better than the angels. You understand? The, for the angels worship Christ. He speak better things than Moses. He speak better things than the Aaronic covenant, the, the, the law, the, 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 the Levitical priesthood. He speak better things because of his sacrifice. You understand? So we were all once refuge. Whether the Jews, they were refuge. You know, they talk, they, 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 they fled as foreigners from Judaism and, and they sought refuge 
in, in Christ now and to lay hold to the hope that is set before us. We, or, or Gentiles, right? They fled their, their culture of idolic worship and fornication and all that stuff. And those pertaining to uh, those kind of uh, worship practices. They fled that and have refuge in Christ, both Jews and Gentiles. Now we lay hold upon the hope which set up before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. Remember, now, when Jesus Christ had died on the cross, the Bible said the veil of the temple has rent. No longer we have we need a high priest to go in the Holy of Holies anymore to, to, to bring the, 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 the slain animal on, on the mercy seat anymore. And no longer we need a scapegoat. Jesus Christ became the lamb that was slain and he became the, the, the scapegoat, which taketh away the sins of the world. He done away with that, 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 that order now. And the veil of the temple has written. And now, now we can go boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace, help, and access in the time of need. It says, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Christ is made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What, whoever the writer of Hebrews, whether Paul or Barnabas, was encouraged them, let them know, don't forget what Christ had done. He is unrighteous to forget the labor. He forget. Don't don't forget. You understand? And you'll find that in in Hebrews chapter number six, verse ten. It says, "For God is not unrighteous to forget your works and labor of love, which you have showed towards His name." If God did not forget. We should not forget. We should not uh, revert, go back. We need to continue to go forward. And God remembers our good works. It says, "It says, God is un, is not unrighteous to forget your works, your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered unto the saints and, and do minister. We got to continue to minister to the saints. I don't care what come or what may in our lives. We got to continue to persevere. We got to continue to minister to the saints and, and do minister. Right now on, on this social media platform, I'm ministering the word of the Lord to you. As I minister the word of the Lord to you, I myself, I should not be a castaway. I myself um, got to um, obey the scriptures. The Bible says search the scriptures and then you might have eternal life. I myself got to continue to be a follower of Christ. As I'm encouraging you to be steadfast, I'm always abound in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your name is not in vain in the Lord. My I too, I got to be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord for as much as I know my labor is not in vain. I too, I could I got to be steadfast. I too got to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where with Christ who had made me free and be not entangled again by the, the law of bondage. I too got to got to uh Fight a good fight. I too have to keep the course and, and, and you know, finish the course and, and keep the faith. Like Paul wrote to his protege Timothy, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished the course and I kept the faith, whether in bonds, whether in persecution and all. I too had to be dedicated to Jesus Christ. I too got to be dedicated to my, my wife. I too got to be dedicated to my 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 families you know my my sons and daughter daughters i too got to be faithful and devout husband love your wives as christ loved the church i too got to you know obey the scriptures i too got to be obedient to christ i too and we too got to be perpetual Followers of Christ. Don't forget, like the, uh, I'm going to close out with that refrain that got me in tears. 
lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Mm. Sila. Thank you, Jesus. And for those of you that don't know the Lord Jesus and the pardon of your sins, I encourage you to get to know him. If you confess with your mouth, based on Romans chapter number 10, verse 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Out of the confession is made unto salvation, out of the heart believe unto righteousness. I offer Christ to you, O oh my brother. I offer Christ to you, O oh my sister. He will give you brand new life. Life abundantly. Come on. Come on. Come to Christ. If you don't know the Lord Jesus in the pardon of this sin, repeat after me. Father God, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. You knew no sin, but became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. I repent. I have a change of mind resulting in a change of conduct. Spirit of the Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Thank you for saving me. If you have said that, my beloved brothers and sisters, welcome to the family of God. Praise God. All right. Um. If you want to be a blessing to um, the, the ministry of El Bethel, there are four ways to give. Hold on a second. There are four ways to give. Um, you could give um, by way of Cash App. My Cash App is dollar sign um, Ernest Spellman. Uh, number two. Uh, give, give, give the five. Um, I gave, I, I put a hat, I, I put a, a, a link on, on, on that. Um, Zell donation, that's E underscore Spellman at yahoo.com. You can also Venmo me at, at earnestly dash Fillmore dash Spellman dash one and PayPal donation. Um, I gave the link also, um, at Ernest Spellman. Once again, at Ernest Spellman. There are four ways to give to the ministry of Alberta. Because one day, you know, I'm gonna have a building. I'm, I'm I'm praying that God will bless me with a with an edifice so that I can do a lot for the kingdom of God. Because I, I I am a firm believer of Hebrews chapter number. Um, 10.25, where it says, ten twenty five. it says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So, that being said, you know, these ways to give is for the future building of El Bethel and what have you, and so forth and so on. So that's it, my beloved brothers and sisters. Uh, let us pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise your name. We glorify your name for your name is great and greatly to be praised. We thank you, Lord, for your word on today. We thank you for Sabbath school recap on today. We thank you, Lord, for the teachings and we thank you, Lord, for the preaching on today. You know, and the message was entitled, God remembers your acts of service. We just thank you, Lord, for your word on today. And Lord, as we dismiss from this media platform or this place, but not from your presence, now to him, who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only God, to the only wise God, us 
our Savior, be glory, majesty, domain, and power, both now and forever. All God's people say amen and amen. Thank you so much once again for tuning in to Sabbath School Recap. It was an honor and a privilege to bring the word of the Lord to you and the comforts of wherever you are. All right. I love you. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Peace.